the Institute of International and European Affairs. I have great pleasure in uh, welcoming you all to uh, our meeting today with uh, Mr. Juan Fernando uh, López Aguiar, who is the chair of the European Parliament's Committee on uh, Civil Liberties, Justice and Home Affairs. We're delighted to have Mr. López Aguiar uh, speak to the IIEA this morning on a topic which is, of, um, which is among the greatest challenges faced by the European Union at present, that is how to, how to bring about and to shape a humane uh, migration and asylum policy for the European Union, um, a challenge which is exacerbated by the particular pressures uh, surrounding the COVID-19 uh, pandemic and um, the, the predicament in which migrants and refugees find themselves as a result. Um, Mr. López Aguiar uh, has been a member of the European Parliament since uh, 2000. He's a distinguished former Minister for Justice of Spain and uh, head of the Spanish Socialist Workers' Party in the Canary Islands. He's also been a, a member of the Spanish Parliament and the Secretary General of the Spanish uh, Socialist Workers' Party in the Canary Islands. At the same time, he has built up a, a, an academic career as a professor of constitutional law at the University of Las Palmas. Um, Mr. López Aguiar will speak to us for about 20 to 25 minutes, and then we'll open the floor to the audience. Um, we're looking forward to what I'm sure will be a very stimulating and, 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 and interesting address, uh, um, which incidentally is, is on the record and, uh, at all points. Mr. López Aguiar, once again, you're very welcome, and the floor is yours. Well, first of all, good day to you all. It is my honor and my privilege. And I'm thankful for giving me the chance to exchange some views with the attendance of this session of yours, Institute of International and European Affairs in Dublin. I hope I will be of some use to this discussion and to its participants. Yes, I'm a professor of law by training. I've been in the European Parliament ever since the Lisbon Treaty entered into force, actually 2009, 2009, uh, after having served in the Spanish government as Minister of Justice. I moved to the European Parliament and have chaired the Committee of Liberties, Justice and Home Affairs, which by the way is the busiest committee in the House, the widest legislative scope and the committee which best expresses the lawmaking dimension of the European Parliament ever since the Lisbon Treaty entered into force. So if you allow me, I will be speaking for, let's say, some, do you, do you see me? Yes, yes. Yes, okay. Because uh, I will be speaking, let's say, for 10, 15 minutes, no more than that, so that I can open as room as possible for the discussion, so that we may exchange views and I can take questions and answers, if you will. Okay, so let's get started. The first point I wanted to make is that precisely the Lisbon Treaty entered into force in coincidence with my landing in the European Parliament 2009, along with the Charter of Fundamental Rights. And with the Lisbon Treaty came along the European Area for Liberty, Justice and Security, which is Articles 67 to 89 from the Treaty of Functioning of the European Union. And in that space, European space for liberty, justice and security, you see that many competences that were long the realm of the member states, the sovereignty of the member states, are now the domain of the European Union competence, including migration and asylum. For a long time, migration and asylum were conceived to be a, a core issue for the sovereignty of the member states, no longer. Now they are European Union competence both for policy making and both and, and law making and we in the european parliament we have grown up to become a true parliament a true law making body in which we do make laws on the matter so the second point i want to make is that according to the lisbon treaty we have adopted laws on migration and asylum and we have done from the european parliament side our best to build up a truly european common asylum system and a common migration policy and legislation. 
So we adopted in the first mandate in which I chaired the Libre Committee 2009-2014, the so-called migration package, along with the Schengen package, which is the uh, set of uh, pieces of legislation which secure free movement within the Schengen area and a common management of the external borders of the European Union and an asylum package. The migration package is, is an array of pieces of legislation. We adopted before I came to the European Parliament, that was in 2008, the so-called return directive but along with the return directive, we have set forth a number of pieces of legislation trying to create some ground for legal entry and legal migration to the European Union, including the uh, single permit directive, including the posted workers directive, including the seasonal workers directive, which are of the essence for many countries, particularly in the agricultural sector, including the blue card directive, so that qualified workers from abroad may enter regularly into the European Union, including the Schengen Borders Code, including the European Visa Code, of which I happen to be a rapporteur myself, too, which sets a common policy to enter the territory of the European Union, along with the so-called interoperability package, which make sure that all of the data at disposal of the visa information system and Schengen information system and ETIAS and entry exit system are compatible and they may be shared among the member states sharing the area of liberties, justice and security. But we also adopted a so-called asylum package in all, including, of course, the agency the special agency which helps the states to handle asylum uh, demands uh, into the European Union, which is the so-called EASO, the Agency for, uh, for um, um, uh, Supporting the Asylum System, and the Dublin Regulation, which is the regulation, which is a European law binding for the member states, which sets the responsibility to handle the asylum requests and to uh, handle the social services and protection which is entailed by the grant of a, ref of a refugee statute. We also adapted the whole asylum array of pieces of legislation, including the qualifications directive, the common procedure directive, the receptions directive, and along with all that, we also established a so-called relocation program, which is binding for the member states, and resettlement program with the help of the UNHCR. So the third point I want to make is that there is no legislative void at all. There is law at sight. There is effective law, which has been enacted by the European Parliament as a true lawmaking body. We have made laws on the matter, and those laws are effective in force, and they are binding for the member states. But the fourth point I want to make is that, in coincidence with the entry into force of the Lisbon Treaty and all this work that we have carried out throughout the years, the European Union has somehow submerged in itself into the worst serious series of crises ever in the European a process history. We know that. There was the Great Recession. Wow! The worst crisis ever. Then there came the so-called migration crisis. Wow! The refugee crisis in the Mediterranean, but not only in the Mediterranean. Brexit and now the COVID pandemic. So it's been a series of critical episodes in which the European Union has lost momentum. And you know what? There has been an increasing number of member states defying, challenging the European law, showing lack of political will to stand by the European principles in every possible way, including the so-called illiberal regimes, which are under the so-called Article 7 procedure, which is also the competence of the Committee of Chair, Committee of Liberties, Fundamental Rights, Justice and Home Affairs. And there have been an increasing number of countries which have been defying 
the legal the mandate of solidarity, binding solidarity and shared responsibility both to handle migration fluxes, external borders of the European Union, and asylum seekers' requests and refugee statute within the European Union. So we have seen an increasing number of infringement procedures dealing with the contempt towards European law that have, has been shown by a number of uh, member states of the European Union and a number of rulings of the European Court of Justice condemning the violations of European law by an increasing number of member states regarding both migration and asylum legislation. And that is why we have come to a, some kind of a deadlock. We have seen that increasingly so, both migration uh, package and asylum package need to be reviewed and updated, but not to step backwards, not to make it in the in the in the wrong direction, but in, in the view of the committee I chair, precisely to refine the legal instruments at site so that everybody knows which are the rules of the game. But making sure that the mandates of binding solidarity and shared responsibility, which are enshrined literally in Article 80 of the Treaty of Functioning of the European Union, are fully respected by all of the member states. Then there came the UN big global pact on migration and asylum adopted by the UN uh, General Assembly a Special Conference in 2018. And then came the Special Conference on Migration and Asylum convened in Geneva with the participation of the IOM, UNHCR, and also the European institutions, including the European Parliament in the delegation that I chaired, December 2019. And then came the idea that we should be needing some kind of an updated pact on asylum and migration to make sure that all the countries abide by the rules of the, of the area of liberty, justice, and security based on mutual trust and effective cooperation, but mostly on solidarity and shared responsibility. So President von der Leyen, on her way to be invested by the vote of the European Parliament, which she did, promised that she would deliver a new pact on asylum and migration. And that commitment has been taken by the new commissioner in charge for the whole portfolio, the Swedish commissioner Ilva Johansson. So throughout her hearing examination, thorough examination of her capacity to, to, to tackle the portfolio uh, that had been invested upon her, she committed herself to deliver a new pact on asylum and migration by March 2020. But you know what? By March 2020, again, all the calendars were <laughs> in, in upheaval, in a complete upheaval because of the coronavirus crisis. Yes, we understand that this coronavirus crisis is a serious matter that has somehow put to a halt the whole calendar of commitments that were to be delivered by the, uh, by the, uh, the, 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 the new commissioner of uh, home affairs. So she has postponed her commitment up until we somehow be back to normal in the European Parliament. I can tell you that chairing the Libre Committee, we have been keeping up our work right from the very first day of this pandemic crisis. Even in the worst conditions, even in confinement measures that have been imposed by many member states upon their citizens, including Spain, including my country, including my government. That means that we have been for some time working in remote, but it's been, yeah, it's been three or four weeks that we are back to Brussels, back to, back to ordinary work in Brussels. Of course, with many difficulties, because it's not easy to get to Brussels in these conditions, but we are. We are doing our best to keep up our work. And we have heard from Commissioner Johansson that she would be delivering her new pact on asylum and migration by late July or early September. I guess it'll be early September. And of course, we are worried that this new pact of asylum and migration shows, and I conclude, what in the view of the Libre Committee, which I represent, and my personal and political view, is the wrong direction. The wrong direction is sticking to what I call a negative outlook to both migration and asylum. 
which means that somehow the European Union keeps in denial of any goodness, seeing any kind of goodness, both in migration and asylum seekers. I, I, I try to explain this, this, this negative view. This negative view uh, dwells on the assumption that migration is a problem and migration is a crisis. More than that, migration is a threat, a threat to European security and a threat to European identity. That is, in my view, a wrong approach, which is doomed to fail. We have actually contested that wrong approach. We have adopted ever since 2016 a series of resolutions in which we endorse what we call the holistic approach, a positive approach towards migration and asylum. Of course, we understand that member states are worried about irregular migration. But let me tell you, in fact, it is seldom told that irregular migrants are returned in more numbers than they enter irregularly into the European Union, which means that even in the worst of the migration crisis, the return policy is, is underway and it's very effective and it's very seldom told, which means that we are no by no means, by no means, we are now uh, uh, under some kind of an invasion. The, 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 the migration fluxes are manageable insofar as there, there's political will to do it the European way and consistent with the European law. Second, the idea is we, the, the, the idea which is the assumption, between, uh, particularly in the council, is we wish migration would not exist, asylum seekers would not exist, but in so long as they exist, in so long as they, as they exist, uh, the, the, the principle is that those countries with vulnerable borders, particularly towards the Mediterranean, the world border, vulnerable external borders of the European Union are the ones to be responsible for securing the borders. That is also a wrong approach. That takes the European view. We have heard complaints time and again from Greece, Malta, Cyprus, Italy, Spain, which have vulnerable borders, exter uh, external borders of the European Union towards the Mediterranean. But we insist that this is a European issue. Those coming to, to our soil are actually looking for, do you see me? Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Uh, excuse me, because I lost track of you. In, in, my, in, my, in my screen, I don't see you anymore. I'm gonna try to, 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 to catch up and get you back. But anyhow, if you can hear me, I'll, I'll finish. So I tell you that we have to overcome this negative look and come to a more positive approach, which includes, of course, cooperation with the countries of origin and transit, which in includes, of course, a, a serious and effective return policy, but which includes also social inclusion, social integration, and legal pathways, regular pathways to make it to Europe. And I conclude, stating a case i have made i have been a strong advocate within the european uh, parliament for two causes one is enlarging the scope of humanitarian visas why because it is a fact that 95 percent of those who have been granted asylum uh, refugee statute within the european union came to the european union in the first place irregularly. Why did they do that? Because they were not given a chance to make it regularly. And by that, I mean that they had to expose themselves to the illicit trafficking of human beings and human exploitation, which is a nightmare, which is an incredible nightmare of human rights violations, absolutely intolerable in a, in a, in a union of the moral statute, a moral stature uh, of, 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 the, of, the, of the EU. That should not happen. They, they have to expose themselves to illicit trafficking of human beings and to the ordeal of crossing the Sahara or, or, or Libya, or, or those, those incredible uh, ordeals, because they are not given the chance to make it regularly to the European Union. We have to, first of all, enlarge legal pathways to make it to the European Union. Second, we have to come about with a truly European framework for search and rescue. Because we see that many times search and rescue are executed 
by NGOs and humanitarian uh, organizations and uh, and uh, and volunteers, which are subject to be criminalized on the grounds of the facilitation directive, which allows member states to equate humanitarian aid or rescuing people at the seas with cooperation with illicit trafficking of human beings, which in my view is unacceptable too. But the point is that those search and rescue operations should not be trusted to NGOs and, uh, and, 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 and humanitarian missions, but to, to, to a truly European uh, effort, which could be also helped with the enhancement of the Frontex agency that we have set in forth uh, by new legislation also adopted in the in the European Parliament. That is why, in my view, it takes uh, a more positive approach, a more positive outlook to uh, really make sense of the new pact of asylum and migration. Otherwise, it should be a missing chance, a missed opportunity that we should not allow ourselves, if we want to actually fulfill the promise of the Lisbon Treaty and the European Charter of, uh, of European, uh, Fundamental Rights of the European Union when it entered into force nothing less than 10 years ago. I stop here and I take your questions. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Lopez Aguiar. I have to say I found that a very uh, uh, impressive and, and passionate presentation. Um, just on a personal note, uh, I should say that much of what you said resonated with me because um, in 2016, the UN General Assembly adopted um, the so-called New York Declaration on Migrants and Refugees. And I happened to be the, the co-facilitator uh, uh, of that negotiation as the Irish ambassador. And one of the things that we were trying to do was to ensure that the positive dimension of migration was accepted worldwide. Uh, I would have to pay a small tribute, by the way, to Peter Sutherland, one of our compatriots, who, as the UN Special Representative for Migration over 10 years, insisted that migration had to be seen as a positive opportunity. And in a sense, I, I followed in Peter's footsteps by getting that sentiment uh, agreed as part of the New York Declaration. You are doing very valuable work in the European Parliament in the same direction, and, and that's one of the reasons why I was very taken by your, your presentation. And, and, and it's now more urgent than ever because of the rise of populism uh, in, in parts of the EU since then. Let's go straight over to questions. Um, and I suppose um, I'll just kick off with, with one uh, myself that you talked about what the European Commission has been trying to do in, uh, in its first few months in, 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 under the new team. What's your reading of the overall political mood at, at present? I suppose uh, you can read best the, the, the sentiment within the parliament, but do you feel that this negativism that you're talking about is still persisting, or do you see any, any, thing, any chinks of light, any reason to be uh, optimistic? Well, first of all, shall I take questions one by one, or shall I take... Uh, shall I hear from you? Yeah. Okay, if, if you allow me, I'll do this first one and then I'll take some, yeah. some, some questions, yeah. I'll take note and then I'll try to summarize my, my, my reaction towards the, 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 the points that I might hear to, to, to hear or, sure. or, to, or to respond to. Well, first of all, that negativism is not declining, on the contrary. It's been on the rise for all too long, for understandable reasons. I said that the European Union has seen the worst series of crises ever. And that series of crises has, have not only confined themselves to be financial or economic, they have, had, they have had political impact and social impact as well. Uh, inequalities on the rise, distrust, have amounted to uh, a, a rise of europhobic trends, nationalistic and reactionary uh, uh, moves, and platforms that have taken advantage of the malaise, of, the, uh, of this uh, um, um, sense of uh, dissatisfaction with the status quo and the kind of answers that were provided by the European Union uh, institutions, particularly throughout the Great Recession. I'm 
to 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 acknowledge too that the kind of response that we are having uh, after the pandemic and the coronavirus crisis is showing that the commission has somehow learned some lessons from the mistakes of the past we criticized heavily i myself as chair of the Liberal committee but also as a socialist because i am a socialist i criticized heavily that the uh, european union reacted too little too late but most importantly in the wrong direction uh, before the great recession and the damage that it caused and the inequalities on the rise in this time the european commission is reacting better is reacting more promptly is reacting more effectively and it's reacting in the right direction it's yet to be seen if it's sufficient or not particularly we are waiting for the council to make up its mind this late july but the point i'm making is that yes there has been there has been distrust and negativism and uh, uh, most of it uh, of its of, of this negativism has been based on assumptions that are to be challenged because they are fake assumptions for instance it is widely uh, spread the impression uh, 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 across the public opinions of the member states that we are subject to somehow or some kind of an invasion ever since the so-called refugee crisis 2015 and uh, that migration is out of control it's never been true the figures even in the worst peak of the refugee crisis which was as a was certainly a consequence of the uh, of the troubles in our neighborhood namely the civil war in syria the protracted civil war and millions displaced mostly to jordan lebanon and turkey not to the european union but those who came to the european union were no by no means an invasion they could have been handled if there would have been some solidarity but there was not so greece felt abandoned then italy felt abandoned towards the libyan coast and the reaction has been there the reaction has been a rise of populistic trends including a change of guard in the italian government in which Salvini, extreme right, nationalistic reactionary, uh, um, somehow interpreted that feeling of many Italians that they had been abandoned and uh, uh, the rest of the member states were turning a blind eye towards the, the, the influxes coming to, to the Italian islands, Aeolic islands or Sicily or, Sicily or Naples uh, from, from, from Libya. Uh, so that negative trend is is still there it has to be tackled with leadership and we urge the commission to play its guiding role not to simply hear from the member states that they're not willing to to cooperate and then come with a minimum common denominator kind of proposal we want on the contrary the commission to show ambition to show leadership to show guidance of course understanding that the member states are reluctant some member states are particularly reluctant but also facing those member states which are not only denying any solidarity towards those who have external borders toward the mediterranean namely the so-called visegrad group mostly hungary poland and the czech republic and and uh, uh, draw, draw the consequences of of that guiding role and leadership including not only infringement procedures but also minorizing those countries in the council we have uh, complained many times that the council has uh, taken on the assumption that its decisions should be made by consensus meaning unanimity unanimity but the European law does not require unanimity from the Council. It would suffice qualified majority. So those member states which are reluctant to show any will to, 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 to stand up to mutual trust and solidarity and shared responsibility should be minorized in the Council. And for that, it takes a commission which takes also its, its guiding role. And of course, negative attitudes are also expressed within the European Parliament, increasingly so. 
because there has been an increase of extreme right, nationalistic and europhobic seats within the European Parliament in the last two elections. And in this particular mandate of the European Parliament, the numbers are high, but they can still be minorized by a pro-European majority, both in the Libre Committee and in the plenary. Of course, it'll take the cooperation between the EPP, which is the first group, the largest group, the s and I'm a socialist, the second group, Renew, the Liberals, third group, but also Greens, and at times, at times, GUE, which are more pro-European than the extreme right and the nationalists, the, 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 the so-called uh, United Left, so that we can build up a majority which can inspire uh, an asylum pact, on, uh, a, 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 a new asylum and migration pact, which is more consistent with European values, with European law, which I insist is effective by now. There is no legis legislative void that needs to be filled in. Maybe we may update it, but there is no legislative void and with humanitarian law, which is binding in the seas, because there is also international humanitarian law, which is violated all much too often, particularly when closing harbors to search and rescue operations. That is illegal in international law. And it's good that it's told, that it's said, that it's outspoken, vocally that's what i do in the libre committee thank you now we hear the rest of the questions okay um thank you very much um uh, i mean you've you've set out the um the um the, the challenges very very clearly um uh, in, and i think we all hope that it'll be possible for the uh european commission to and and the parliament to help to stimulate a consensus uh, uh, on the new pact. So just turning to some of the questions, um, first of all, uh, a question generally about the, um, uh, the, the role of the African Union in, in, in terms of uh, promoting uh, more legal pathways for people to come to the EU and also in curbing irregular migration flows. How do you see the, the partnership with the African Union? And I suppose generally, uh, more, more generally, do you see a, f a risk that the, let, let's call it the delay of a few years that we've had in, 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 in updating the, um, the union's migration asylum policy, is there a risk that that, that will, uh, or is already affecting partnership relationships with uh, our partners in Africa? Um, I mean, are, are they coming to doubt perhaps uh, European sincerity on all of these issues. A third question I just add in is Libya. Do you do you feel that um, specifically, uh, um, or how would you like to see the new pact deal with Libya, with the Libyan search and rescue area, and the allegations of human rights abuses there? So, if, if that's not too much, uh, I, I, I'll, I'll invite you to address those. Okay, thank you. Thank you for the questions. Very interesting. I'll try to summarize. First of all, it must be said that there is an internal dimension of the asylum and migration policy and lawmaking in the European Union, which points out to the responsibilities of the member states to abide by European law. But there is also an external dimension, which takes a lot of European Union going global and behaving as a global actor, worth of its name. That is, in my view, the challenge of the European diplomacy, the European External Action Services, which are headed by, everybody know, the so-called High Representative, which is also Vice President of the Commission, and which is also chairing the Council of General Affairs, that means the Council of International Relations or Foreign Policy, uh, when, when, when it comes to the gathering of member states, foreign ministers. That is Pepe Borrell, the Spanish guy in charge by now. First it was, we, we, we know, um, uh, uh, before him it was Federica Mogherini, and uh, um, well, we have been rehearsing the capacities of the European Union to engage with the African Union which is uh, uh, sitting in, in, in its uh, quarters in Ethiopia, uh, Addis Abeba. I think it is most interesting that we do our best 
to get the cooperation of the countries which are also being part of this experience of uh, uh, combining energies uh, to 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 secure uh, fruitful and constructive interlocution with the rest of the global actors, including the European Union. I may say that the first foreign visit of President von der Leyen when she uh, uh, when she took office was precisely to the African Union headquarters in Addis Abeba, and the same goes with the High Representative. So we're taking seriously Africa. It is increasingly the great, the great interlocutor for the European Union, increasingly so. I could also say that as a Spaniard, I also insist, I always insist that we should not overlook Latin America. But yes, it is a fact that Africa is the giant. Africa is the giant, the neighboring giant for the European Union. And we need to cooperate with Africa, particularly when it comes to countries of origin and transit. The second point I want to make is that it is important that we know, and it is seldom told, that migrations are in Africa of gigantic dimension, within Africa, within Africa. In the European Union, it is often the impression in the public opinion of the member states that all migrants, all potential migrants of the European Union are looking, are, 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 are looking outwards to the European Union, are looking to the European Union, are approaching the European Union. It's a complete fake, it's complete false. Migrations are taking place all over the world, and I would say the continent, which is by now more reluctant and more armored against migration, in uh, the, 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 I mean, the, the, the global actor, which is more aggressively uh, 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 reluctant and, and, and negative towards migration, is, is, uh, keeps being the European Union, is still the European Union. It is, it is a very small percentage of the migration flows in the world, those who are approaching the European Union. But those who are approaching the European Union, we need to take them seriously and cooperate with the African countries. I would also add that, yes, uh, when it comes to legal pathways, we have to understand that enlarging the legal pathways would be a way to tackle and dismantle what we call the illicit trafficking of human beings business model. They make a lot of money. They make a lot of money of the lack of legal pathways. There are so many in despair that considering that they cannot make it to Europe regularly, they pay whatever the price, even indebting themselves for the rest of their lives to mobs, mobsters and, 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 uh, and traffickers for the sake of being given a chance to approach the European Union. And that is a misery that we cannot tolerate. We should combat it with a constructive approach that has to be European if we want to be effective when having an interlocution with a global actor as it is the, the, the African Union underway. And yes, it is, uh, uh, I think uh, there, has been, there has been a postponement and a delay because for all too long we have dragged our feet. But I would say when we approach the European architecture that we should single out the accountability of every institution. In my view, the European Parliament is still breathing a European majority and is still making up its mind. We still build majorities in the European Parliament. We still enact laws, first reading, second reading. It is in the Council where you find the deadlock, the deadlock in all too many issues. In the Council, we see that many, many files have been blocked, including Dublin regulation which bears the name of the capital of Ireland. Dublin regulation is known all over the world. And every time I talk about Dublin regulation, I have to explain what is it about. Where is the deadlock of Dublin regulation? Because literally it sets the responsibility for handling the asylum request and protecting the refugee on the country of first entry, which means, number one, an overload to countries with a, with a border towards the Mediterranean, namely Greece, Cyprus, Malta, Italy, and Spain. Second, it does not prevent secondary movements because once, we are there, once they are there, despite the efforts of those countries and all the resources that are requested from those countries, uh, asylum seekers or refugees keep moving, keep moving somewhere else. At times, of course, 
for the sake of better standards towards north. So there is a, a situation which proves dysfunctional, subject to criticism, to continued tax of war and arguments, which result in increasing distrust between member states. We need to tackle the issues, but not to deny shared responsibility or solidarity, but on the contrary, to reaffirm shared responsibility and solidarity while updating, updating the instruments, refining the instruments to make sure that solidarity is in place. So those are the challenges by now. And yes, we have seen a delay, but we only hope that it will be overcome when, when we can be back to some better level of normality in the functioning of our institutions right after the summer break in September after this coronavirus crisis. And as to Libya, I'll be clear on this. Once upon a time, Libya was a failed state. But it's been some time that Libya is a no state at all. It's a terrible place where the most uh, unthinkable violations of human rights take place on a regular basis. It shouldn't be with impunity. But that is the situation by now. And I find it appalling that for the sake of dirty realism, some kind of a dirty realism, dirty realpolitik, member states are negotiating with whatever or whoever is in Libya for the sake of preventing migrants to take the risk of sailing afloat towards the European Union with the risk of perishing in the attempt. That is terrible. The, the, uh, the uh, concentration camps in, in Libya, the, the, the kind of facilities in which uh, um, uh, those coming from, from sub-Saharan Africa approaching the Libyan coast are detained and subject to uh, unbearable human rights violations, including abuses of women and children, terrible abuses of women and children cannot be overlooked indefinitely by the European Union. And yes, we know that out of despair, Italy was the first to try to negotiate with Libya to prevent more uh, irregular migrants trying to approach the Italian coast uh, out of what we might call this dirty real politic exercise. It is miserable. We should not tolerate that indefinitely. But for sure, and I conclude, Libya is no safe harbor. Mm -hmm. And it takes safe harbor for the European Union to cooperate with disembarkation of, uh, um, of uh, people rescued at sea of, or in whatever the, the, the situation. And it, it, it happens all too often that people are intercepted on their way to Europe and be brought to the Libyan coast with the cooperation of uh, the, the, the European Union agency, Frontex. That should not happen. We should criticize that many times because in our view it's intolerable. Libya is no safe place at all. And Libyan harbors are not safe harbors at all. That is what is uh, very uh, clearly uh, uh, stated in every resolution that has been adopted by the European Parliament. Thank you very much, Mr. Dobas Aguiar. Um, uh, I'll pass on now, if I may, three further questions, which I think are linked. Uh, one uh, from a colleague in, in one of our universities in Dublin, uh, uh, Dublin City University, is really about the issue of European values. I mean, you touched on that at one point. Can one really talk about moving towards uh, uh, or having common European values when certain member states uh, and I think we all know the names um, are, are are showing hostility towards uh, towards migration um, towards inward migration. And, and a, a related question would be the rule of law. How should we react to the fact that um, there are threats to the rule of law um, uh, from uh, such member states? Um, and then thirdly, perhaps in a more positive vein. Do you think that Germany, uh, as presidency of the Council, will have a better chance of unlocking, of, of, of um, overcoming the deadlock 
on the council that you were talking about? Yeah, that's a good set of questions, Sue. I thank you for that. First of all, values of the essence. I have said it a million times. The European Union is not the euro. The European Union is not the single market. The European Union is a union of law. And law takes principles and values. And you know what? They are enshrined. Once they were somehow vaguely defined by the rulings of the European Court of Justice, but now they have been put in writing. Article 2 of the Treaty of the European Union. What once were called the so called Copenhagen criteria are no European constitutional values, namely rule of law, representative democracy, equality under the law, separation of powers, which include judicial protection of fundamental rights, pluralism, political pluralism, protection of minorities, which means the guarantee of the function of the opposition, which means that I, as chair of the Committee of Fundamental Rights, Liberties and Justice and Home Affairs of the European Parliament, I have presided a number of delegations to what we call the, what they call themselves, illiberal regimes. But you know what, those illiberal regimes, namely, namely Hungary and Poland, subscribed to the Treaty of Lisbon so that it entered into force. And now they are bound to those values. They are bound to the Treaty of Lisbon. They are bound to the Charter of Fundamental Rights, which came along with the Lisbon Treaty. So they cannot simply violate those values and get away with it. And in our view, in the view of the Libre Committee, they violate those values when they equate democracy with the rule of majority. Democracy is not simply ruling by law, laws enacted by a majority in parliament. Democracy is rule of law, which means that no one is allowed to break the law, not even a, a parliamentary majority. When there is a constitution and where there are constitutional values that are enshrined in the European law. And democracy has never been simply the rule of majority. Democracy means protecting minorities. And that is also put in writing in Article 2 of the Treaty of the European Union. So we do care about those regressions, those constitutional breakdowns that have been taking both a place in, in, in both member states. I insist, I, I underline, member states of the European Union. Hungary and Poland. That is why, from the European Parliament, we launched Article 7 procedure, which is the device at, the, at, 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 at disposal, which is device at our hand. Of course, it is cumbersome, the procedure. We adopted both the initiative in Hungary and Poland with two-thirds majority of the European Parliament. Not easy. That wasn't easy. It took us a long way, a lot of negotiations. And of course, it took a serious of, 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 of very grave indications of violating European Union values from those member states. It took us much hearing of the authorities of both countries. I have, I have been in both countries. I, of course, I have had talks with their prime ministers, with the ministers of justice, but yet we, we, we have seen that there have been a, a number of laws enacted by parliaments of those countries which are been uh, subject to the rulings of the European Court of Justice, and yet those countries keep uh, uh, in, con in contempt of the rulings of the European Court of Justice. That shouldn't happen. That is why we insist from the Council that they should take on the Article 7 procedure that we and the European Parliament have set in motion. That is our response, and it is a serious matter, a very serious matter that we see that there are countries which are in denial of fundamental principles of, of, of European law, including, in this regard, of the area of liberty, justice, and security, any responsibility and any solidarity with those countries which are overloaded with hotspots or uh, uh, migration fluxes or asylum seekers. For instance, everybody knows that there were decisions being taken by the Council in order to relocate those which are overloading the capacities of certain hotspots in the Greek islands, namely Samos and, uh, and uh, Lesbos, and uh, at times in Italy too. And these countries were subject to a procedure before the European Court of Justice, and the European Court of Justice 
stated that they had violated the European law by denying denying any any uh, solidarity in their relocation programs and not accepting uh, 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 migrants or asylum seekers coming from the hotspots of the overloaded capacities of the countries I've mentioned. So that is a serious existential challenge for the for the European Union, and we should not over underestimate the importance of that existential challenge. It is miserable that we keep hearing the testimonies of journalists being harassed, uh, uh, judges that have been removed from their positions and the, 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 the preposterous allegation that they are some kind of a heritage of the communist regime, that they should be purged for the sake of the sanity of the Polish judicial system, let alone talk, let alone talk of the so-called LGBT free zones in Poland, which is subnotious, which is completely against European law, which forbids discrimination of people on the basis of their sexual orientation, that denial of European values should not be underestimated. In my view, they pose a serious existential challenge of the European Union. And as to Germany, yes, it's a veteran, it's a heavyweight. Well, we have seen, because that's the, that's the dynamic of the European architecture, we have seen a number of small member states of the European Union exercising their rotating presidency for the first time ever. We come from the Croatian presidency now. Croatia is the latest comer to the European Union. It entered into the European Union as number 28 by then uh, in 2013, the other day, yesterday, yesterday evening, so, so to say. But Germany, Germany is a founding member state, it's the heavyweight. So <laughs> we, we expect from Germany a certain energy to tackle, to take on pending files, deadlocks, and riddle them, put some energy to get them going, and some influence to, 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 to break deals when necessary, yes. And if I may say, I have written its program, because every rotating presidency comes out with a certain uh, written declarations of their ambitions, and it's, it's quite, quite large, quite, quite, quite significant, and it includes a very explicit chapter of rule of law a very explicit charter, chapter regarding Article 7 procedures, which in my view is meaningful. So I only hope that Germany will be of help not only, not only to unriddle the current deadlock as to the so-called recovery plan and its instruments, grants, mostly grants and some loans with a proper combination of own resources and bonds, your recovery bonds for the so-called new generation a recovery plan for Europe and also uh, unriddle the deadlock of the uh, of the rule of law procedures which are still pending on the, in the table of the council for all too long because we in the European Parliament we have done a part of the job. I take more questions. Okay thank you very much Nat, and thank you again for the, the the passion and the commitment that that you show in response to uh, all of these questions. Uh, so um, there was a question from um, uh, a colleague uh, about really the, the disparities in the way in which asylum cases are decided on uh, from one member state to another. Uh, in other words, despite the various directives on asylum policy, for example, the return directive you referred to and the qualification directive, it seems that positive decisions on asylum cases vary greatly from one member state to another. How can we overcome these uh, disparities? Can we overcome them? Um, uh, th that's really the, the, the question. And then let me quote also a, a comment which the ambassador of Malta uh, to Ireland has just made. And it really goes back to what you were saying a moment ago, uh, Juan Fernando, about um, uh, uh, the, the uh, unfair burdens carried within the EU. So the ambassador makes the point that um, Malta has received over 22,000 uh, migrants and asylum seekers since 2005, of whom only 8% have been relocated to EU countries. A handful of member states, the ambassador says, can't be expected to continue shouldering responsibility for migration flows. We need decisive and sensible solutions 
particularly permanent and predictable relocation mechanisms. We can't depend any further on ad hoc solutions with only some member states pledging support. You'll be familiar with those um, sentiments, but uh, if you could come back on the uh, 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 asylum cases, that would be very interesting. That's probably all we have time for, because I, I, I know that you have another commitment to, to go to. Thank you again for the questions, most interesting. Of course, I thank all the participants and I thank all the attention that uh, might be uh, given to, to these issues which are sensitive and divisive. Uh, I could start out each and every one of my answers by saying, we're talking, now we're talking. Of course, these serious matter and they, 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 they are open problems. So let me tell you that Whenever I, I am part of this kind of conversation, I, I feel like saying, hey, listen, your concerns are my concerns. Your sensitiveness is my sensitiveness. And your, 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 your disarray, your, your dismay before the status quo as it stands by now is my dismay. I'm also unhappy about the situation. I'm a fighter. I'm, 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 I'm not here not only to provide an analysis, I, I, I am here to, to, to put up a fight on, on these sensitive issues and to, and to take a side because they are divisive. I tell you, in the European Union, there, there are speeches and, and there are attitudes which are very confrontational on these delicate matters. And I understand that. But having said this, you have dwelt on points which are now precisely subject to discussion into this exact point of time, disparities, despite the effective law that we have adopted, it is a fact that there are many disparities into the member states' behavior. Some handle asylum seekers' requests with efficiency and uh, provide a sufficient level of protection and so much more uh, mean towards the possibilities of the law which is which is which is effective and which could be inspiring the kind of response uh, it depends largely on, on on political will but we gotta make sure that at least we have provided the legislative uh, 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 the pieces of legislation the legislative framework which uh, secures that there is a european common asylum system which makes sense at the European level and does not simply rely on the political will of the different member states to do uh, this or that uh, in a certain degree of extensions or depth. You may see that particularly when it comes to receiving uh, people rescued in the seas. Uh, you have seen that all too long the solution, particularly with the Malta Declaration, which was meaningful, and it was appreciated by the European Union. We said it is a, it is a step in the, in the in the right direction. But is it enough? Is it sufficient? Is it acceptable as a, as a European response? The answer to those questions keeps being no, because in the Malta Declaration, what it is behind it is always some phone calls between member between prime ministers, which come up with a certain level of compromise, a certain level of of, of, of mutual assistance in the lack of a truly European kind of response. And an exchange of phone calls between prime ministers is never enough as a European response. It, it, is not, it, it does not suffice that whenever there is a boat stranded in the sea, particularly with vulnerable people, pregnant women, or women with little kids, minors, what we call unaccompanied minors too, that means minors without a mother, without a parent to take care of them. And what is the answer? Some prime minister calls to another prime minister and says, hey, listen, you take five, I take eight, and this other guy takes 10, and that'll do for this time. For this time being, that'll do. Is it a European answer? No, that is not. We need a European framework. Those issues are the ones which are to be discussed with the occasion of the new pact on asylum and migration. Those issues not simply the obsession on returning, 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 because I insist returning is a very effective policy. But I insist we also have to care about binding solidarity. Greece has been complaining about lack of solidarity and the rest of the member states turning a blind eye on them. That is the origin of Golden Dawn, which is the, the Nazi 
extreme right in Greece. Malta has complained about lack of solidarity of the rest. And the Maltese case is very significant because it is often told by the Maltese authorities, and they make a right point, a fair point, fair enough, that they are the smallest country in the European Union. Their population is 400,000. For them to receive 22,000, it means a percentage of its population that would equate like Germany having 2 million uh, asylum seekers uh, all of a sudden because 20,000 for 400,000 is a percentage completely unbearable to the size of Malta. Uh, so Malta needs and, and deserves solidarity from the rest. And I insist solidarity ever since the Lisbon Treaty entered into force is no longer a desideratum. It's no longer a wishful thinking. It's no longer a, I wish it could happen. It is a binding mandate. It's a legal mandate enshrined by the law. So there has to be solidarity. No solidarity at all is not a legal choice. It's not a choice which is accordance, in, accordance, in conformity with European law. On the contrary, it violates European law, denying all solidarity with Malta. And uh, the same came with Italy, which, which I said at a certain point of time, uh, some, somehow slipped into the dark side of the force with the extreme right uh, uh, interior minister, uh, which was extremely disruptive for the for the management of the, this whole thing and uh, of course it is also uh, systematically so the case of spain and in the canary islands believe me believe me because uh, i live in the canary islands and uh, but, uh, maybe many of you do not know that by now canary, uh, canary islands is back again number one highest peak of irregular uh, uh, migrants coming uh, uh, aboard these so-called wooden boats cayucos from Western Africa. So we have a problem of lack of solidarity here. These are the issues that are to be dealt with with the occasion of the new uh, mig uh, Migration and Asylum Pact, because we are not happy with the status quo. We need to make sure that there is a commission which is highly committed to, to secure solidarity to those countries which have this external border of the European Union in the understanding that the impact and the effect of it all is truly European, that they are bound to come to the European Union, not only to Malta, not only to the Canary Islands, not only to the Greek Islands, or to the Olic Islands in, in Italy. They're, they're actually bound European. They're, they're the European Union bound, uh, bound words. That is, the, that is the issue here. And then, of course, uh, when it comes to the, uh, to the uh, uh, asylum uh, uh, fluxes and, uh, and uh, inequalities, um, I, I would simply add, that uh, uh, returns uh, are very effective. They are mostly handled on the grounds of national capacities. There are many flights that are hired precisely to return uh, irregular migrants uh, from, from, from different member states, sometimes with the cooperation of Frontex, which is enlarging its capacity the so-called Frontex, which is now the European uh, External Border uh, and uh, Coast Guard Agency. But in all, uh, it, it, is, it is a fact that secure a, a European common asylum system overseen by the agency, EASO agency, and uh, with, with, uh, with a true European will, will take a new political cycle and i only hope that this commission understand the problem understands the problem right gets the problem right and does its very best to persuade those member states which are reluctant to to to, to be part of this european system framework and answer that they have to move in their in the right direction and still enlarging the, 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 the possibilities of uh, those who are truly entitled to refugee state statute according to, to international humanitarian law and to the qualifications directive to be part of the European social fabric, to be given the chance to, 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 to settle in the European Union and to be part and to contribute to the European diversity and wealth in every possible 
way. That takes, in my view, also a financial support. From the European Union, we have done our best to increase the budgeting in this regard. We have came forth with a number of instruments. A migration and asylum fund, so-called AMIF, and we have insisted that it has to be financed properly. An internal security fund, which is precisely to make sure that interoperability results in returns when they are needed. Although I insist that returns are more effective than 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 uh, than widely uh, than widely um, seen, they, they, I, I usually come to the to the to the discussion just to check that many people think that there are no returns at all in Europe. That everybody who sets foot sets foot on on, on on European soil is here for good. Not true. Many of them are returned effectively, but those instruments, including the Asylum and Migration and Internal Security Fund, should be a part of a new landscape in which we should be more consistent with the values and the principles that we have enshrined in European law. And I only wish that this opportunity, this chance of discussing a new Asylum and Migration Pact, which is consistent with the, uh, the, the global and migration um, and asylum pact, which was adopted by the UN declaration in December 2008 and uh, continued with the, with the conference in Geneva 2019, uh, this opportunity, this, this chance will not be missed, that we will be delivering. Because in my view, there is nothing more threatening for the European Union nothing more threatening by far more threatening than the idea of migration or asylum out of control by far more threatening than that if there is something threatening is the divorce between the european union promise and its delivery it is about time that we actually deliver with a truly european common migration and asylum system worth of its name uh, thank you Thank you very much, Mr. Lopez Aguiar. Uh, thank you for uh, a superb uh, tour d'horizon of, of all the issues we're facing in relation to migration and asylum. Um, it's clear that a, a humane new pact and new policy will be in safe hands in the European Parliament uh, uh, under, your, uh, under your watch. And we all look forward to a, 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 an ambitious uh, um, outcome to what the Commission is 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 trying to do at present. We hope that they will take your advice uh, uh, um, uh, to heart and uh, we look forward to the right kind of pact emerging from that. Thank you for giving us your time. Thank you for your insights, your analysis, most of all for your passion and your conviction on all of these issues which are central to the, the European values. Thanks very much. I hope we haven't detained you too long. We found it very rich and stimulating and we hope we'll see you again sometime. Thank you very much indeed. It is me to thank you, the International and European Affairs Institute in Dublin. It is me to thank you for giving me this opportunity to talk to you and be of some help. That was my aim, to provide some European Parliament insight. And of course, state the case of the European Parliament, which in my view, it is always of significance to clear out that within the European architecture, there are institutions. And there are some institutions which actually behave European. That is the case of the European Court of Justice. That is the case of the European Parliament. But it takes, in my view, <laughs> it, it takes some time to, to, to see the Council behaving truly European, not simply the sum of national governments, looking at the national interests, but also looking European, going European in the, in the, in the expression of their political will. But anyhow, my only aim was be of some use to this uh, to this gathering, and um, and I thank you. I truly thank you for that. And I only hope, as I said, that this occasion of us in this mandate of the European Parliament would be fruitful to deliver a new asylum and migration pact, which are not only humane, consistent with humanitarian and international and European law, but also effective also effective which is also um, uh, translated from words to acts 
Thank you for that.